Hi everyone. All right, so in this video, um, I want to discuss several books I've read uh, more than once and the impact that they have made on me. All right. Now, I might as well just get started. The first book I want to talk about, and yes, some of these books will probably surprise you, but that's you know these are my um, these are the books I enjoy reading. And first, I want to talk about this book, Tupac Shakur. Yes, I'm a Tupac fan. I um, have been listening to his music since I was a kid, so I figured, um, why not read his book, right? Read, we'll read a, the book about him. It was written by Tayana Lee McGillar and Fred L. Johnson, who's a PhD. And it tells the story of, um, of his life and, and everything that he went through and the people that he met and growing up in California and Baltimore and and how he got to be friends with Jada Pinkett, who later became Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, Will Smith's wife. And, and uh, she acted in many, many uh, movies throughout the years. And she was uh, in this TV show that I was following for a little bit called um, Gotham. Um, she played the character Fish Mooney in Gotham. But um, yeah, I, um, I've always been fascinated with Tupac and, and his life and his life and the rivalries that he had in music and, and how he worked hard to get his start. And this is a book I've read several times of all the books I've ever read. And I really enjoy his music and I figure uh, I should definitely um, read, read a little passage out of uh, this book. It's been some time since I've... Uh, uh, read, read from it, but why not read from it? All right, so this is chapter 19, Thug Life. It wasn't the mother of all bad ideas, but it came close. When Tupac Shakur decided to launch his urban social reform movement under the banner of Thug Life, his image fell under intense scrutiny. The truth within the acronym, the hate you give little infants fucks everyone, was understood well enough by those who both who bothered to look beneath the surface message. But unfortunately for Tupac Shakur, when most Americans heard the word thug, it conjured images that were consistent with the dictionary definition of the word, a cutthroat, a ruffian, a hoodlum. But Tupac failed to comprehend the historical and contemporary forces and institutions arrayed against him. That the majority of Americans would have been ignorant of the message contained in thug life was not surprising. The banner simply confirmed that what they had already felt about rappers anyway. But members of the hip-hop community had always believed that black men had it within their power to make positive, lasting change. They believed that it would come in a variety of forms and would take many hands and voices. Tupac Shakur was ready to lend his talent, voice, and passion to the cause. Given his painful upbringing, it was no surprise that Tupac was primed and ready to do his part in leading young black people into better days. Ending black-on-black -black violence was long overdue, liberating the black community from the, from the scourge of crack addiction and the dealers who sold the poison to their own people would constitute a miracle from God, and healing the rifts between black men, women, and children so that families could be strengthened, education pursued, and achievement cherished were actions that needed rapid implementation. Unfortunately, his well-intentioned plan to achieve radical change was so ridiculous and counterproductive that even if it had worked, the black community would not have advanced an inch. Tupac's plan for the thug life was discussed with his stepfather, Matulu Shakur, during a prison visit in 1992. Reclamation of the black community was surely a goal worth pursuing, but sadly for Tupac, he was up against a history that guaranteed a perversion of his intentions once he articulated them from beneath his dubious heading of thug life. Now, black people's long experience in America offered numerous historical examples of the majority would resist sudden radical change for the better within the black community. And you see, I, I have um, no qualms with reading this book whatsoever. In fact, I felt proud to uh, learn more about um, one of my um, musical idols, Tupac Shakur. I enjoyed reading this book very much. I've read it several times over the past few years. Um, and then it says, in 1831, when Nat Turner and others had sought to throw off their bondage, their effort was called an insurrection. When Frederick Douglass liberated himself from the same miserable system, he was declared a fugitive. 
When Rosa Parks refused to give up her bus seat and her dignity, she was deemed a public threat. When Malcolm X spoke truths about the daily violence endured by blacks in America, his message was cynically reinterpreted as a call for violence. When Martin Luther King Jr. vowed to win civil rights for black people through love, he was labeled a communist and an enemy of the state. So it just, it just goes to show you that all the efforts that people in the black community tried to put forth, they were always subjected to negative interpretations by, I want to say, uptight white people. But that's not, that's, um, that's a history. That's, uh, the, that's part of the black experience in America that, that I've um, seen through, through um, you know, the window of uh, history through television and other media. And um, it really tells a, a remarkable story of um, uh, the the kinds of um, the lifestyle that that black people were subjected to, and and um, and how really it it was always um, I believe those in power, you know, who who maintained uh, um, maintained a stranglehold on these people. I, I truly believe that, and I, I know that's a harsh way in, in putting it, but it's true. It's it's what's called a, a, a financial stranglehold, and, and you see it in many different in many different lights and, and the way things work. It, I, I just wish that um, that there was more of, more access to voting, um, you know, that voter rights here in America weren't suppressed. You see that a lot in the South. They, they get away with murder down south. I mean, the minimum wages um, for, for people, I think the average is $7.25 an hour. I mean, who cares if, 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 if the cost of living is is cheaper down south if you have a minimum wage that's in the, the, in the Stone Age, you know? Um, but it's definitely something to be, um, to be focused on and be interested with. But really very interesting um very interesting stuff here now next up we have uh, the great gatsby i've read this book several times many times it wasn't my choice to read it i had to read this book twice in high school but um beautiful book i think beautifully written um I, th I think they have some, I think it's such a beautifully written, written book. I'm just going to read a couple pages out of here. This is, once again, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. She got up slowly, raising her eyebrows at me in astonishment, and followed the butler toward the house. I noticed that she wore her evening dress, all her dresses, like sports clothes. There was a jauntiness about her movements, as if she had first learned to walk upon golf courses on clean, crisp mornings. I was alone, and it was almost two. For some time, confused and intriguing sounds had issued from a long, many-windowed room with which overhung the terrace. Eluding Jordan's undergraduate, who was now engaged in obst obstetrical conversation with two chorus girls and who implored me to join him, I went inside. The large room was full of people. One of the girls in yellow was playing the piano, and beside her stood a tall, red-haired young lady from a famous chorus engaged in song. She had drunk a quantity of champagne, and during the course of her song, she had decided ineptly that everything was very, very sad. She was not only singing, she was weeping. Whenever there was a pause in the song, she filled it with gasping, broken sobs, and then took up the lyric again in a quavering soprano. The tears coursed down her cheeks, not freely, however, for when they came into contact with her heavily beaded eyelashes, they assumed an inky color, and pursued the rest of the wearing slow black rivulets. A humorous suggestion was made that she sing the notes on her face, whereupon she threw up her hands, sank into a chair, and went off into a deep, venous sleep. It's like almost literally the impression I get from looking at this cover right here. And isn't it interesting that that's the page that I that I that I turn to? You see, you see the cover of the woman crying. But yeah, I, I think it's absolutely beautiful, beautifully written written book. Um, there's other parts in here that I think are are um, are very well written. 
Once I wrote down on the empty spaces of a timetable the names of those who came to Gatsby's house that summer. It is an old timetable now, disintegrating at its folds and headed the schedule in effect July 5th, 1922. But I can still read the gray names and that they will give you a better impression than my generalities of those who accepted Gatsby's hospitality and paid him the subtle tribute of knowing nothing whatever about him. From East Egg, then came the Chester Becketts and the Leeches, and a man named Bunsen, whom I knew at Yale, and Dr. Webster Kivett, who was drowned last summer up in Maine, and the Hornbeams and the Woolly Voltaires, and a whole clan named Blackbuck, who always gathered in a corner and flipped up their noses like goats at whosoever came near. And these maze and the Christies, or rather Hubert Arbeck and Mr. Christie's wife, Edgar Beaver, who, whose hair they say turned con white one winter afternoon for no good reason at all. Clarence and Dave was from East Egg, as I remember. He came only once in white knickerbockers and had a fight with a bum named Eddie in the garden. From West Egg came the Poles and the Mulreddies, and Cecil Roebuck and Cecil Schoen and Gulick. We're talking about Jewish people in this, in this, in this section of the book. And, you know, being Polish myself, I'm sure I have Jewish blood. Um, I mean, if you look at me, I could look kind of Jewish. But that's, um, you know, that's part of my heritage, you know. I, I, I recently learned that, um, that Hitler killed several members of my family w when he had occupied Poland. And, and immediately when I learned about that, that that's when I completely just... Just, I have no regard whatsoever for, for people um, in the South that, that speak out against uh, their little Confederate monuments being removed. I say fuck those people. And that, you know, we should remove as many of those Confederate monuments as possible. I don't care what they are to them. Those are symbols of hate and, and symbols of a regression society. And those who want to regress, you know, they can do it on their own time, but not on the people's time. And that is my wholehearted belief. Now next up, um, we have a book like I was just talking about. Um, it's called In My Hands, Memories of a Holocaust Survivor. Now, it says, In My Hands began as one non-Jew's challenge to any who would deny the Holocaust. Much like the Diary of Anne Frank, it has become a profound document of an individual's heroism in the face of the greatest evil mankind was known. In the fall of 1939, the Nazis invaded Irene Gut's beloved Poland. Now, Irene Gut, I believe, was Catholic, um, and it said, moving on, ending her training as a nurse and thrusting the 16-year-old, 16-year-old Catholic girl into a world of horrors that somehow gave her the strength to accomplish what amounted to miracles. Brutally abused and left for dead by Russian soldiers, Irene escaped into German-occupied territory, where she was forced to work for the German army. Her Aryan features landed her a job in the relative safety of an officer's dining room. With access to food and supplies, as well as the dinner conversations of SS officials, Irene was able to smuggle nourishment and information to the Jews in the, in the ghetto, transport work camp prisoners to a forest enclave, and ultimately hide a dozen Jews in the home of the Nazi major for whom she was housekeeper. So obviously, she's an amazing woman. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if she's still around today, but um, to my knowledge, she has passed on. And and that that is um, pretty much the conclusion of books that I've read several times in my life. And, and yeah, they are interesting titles. But um, there's another book I want to discuss today that I'm very fascinated with. And it is called... Everything you know is wrong behind the paranormal. Now, I met these interesting individuals a few months ago. I was over at, um, now, don't worry about my cat, Tigger. He, he's, he's an old cat, and he's fed constantly, and I think sometimes he doesn't remember um, certain things. He's, he's almost 17 years old. He's, he's an amazing cat, and um, I, I'm not neglecting him at all. I, I have been feeding him, and and he's how he gets hungry, and and I think sometimes a little disoriented, but he's fine. Um, but about this book, what's really interesting is that I was at this little conference at the Danbury Public Library uh, 
uh, a few months ago. And let me tell you, that's a, if you ever get the chance uh, to visit Danbury, visit their public library. They have a really nice library. It's, it's a very it's a open spaces, um, uh, capacious to describe, if you will. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, going to this conference. It was, um, it was a UFO conference. Um, now, UFOs are unidentified flying objects or unidentified aerial phenomenon, which are like what people believe to be to be to be vehicles um, from outside this world. Now, it's definitely something worth considering that, you know, think about it. If if we're here in the solar system, there's a very good chance that there's other people out there in, the, in other parts of, you know, the universe. I, I think that's extremely likely that there's life beyond our planet. I'm, I'm almost, I want to say I'm 90% certain that, that there is life beyond Earth. And I'm not going to get into the idiosyncrasies of all that now, but I really find this book here to be very fascinating. And the speech that this man gave, I mean... It, it, I'll, let me tell you, it was a lot of information to process at first, and it, it really, really surprised me. He told us about all these different things. Like he, he even said that there was supposedly a military installation up in the Litchfield Hills, and he said that there's a portal up there that supposedly where people in the military are able to teleport themselves to other parts of America. Now, I don't know if the, what this guy is saying is fine as, um, you know, really should be believed. You know, I'm skeptical myself, but it really makes for an interesting conversation. It makes you wonder, wow, is this, is this even possible? Is teleportation possible? Is time travel possible? Even Albert Einstein himself, he theorized, um, the I ideas of teleportation and, and time travel. It really makes you wonder. I mean, could there be installations up in the wealthy Litchfield Hills that, that have some sort of scientific resources that, that are being guarded by the military? I have encountered the military before um, being out in public. I have encountered um, the National Guard um, just driving through my town. Hi, Mom. Oh, brother. I was taking a video. Can you shut that down? I Why? Because I look like hell. Well, you're only in, in, in the video for a few seconds. Doesn't few matter. I want it taken out. Well, I'm 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 putting it on Facebook anyway. Okay, just remember what I told you about. I don't care about that. You know that that's that's not my my problem. So on that note, I'm gonna end this video. And can um, you erase it? No, I'm putting it on Facebook because this is what I plan to do. Yeah, but you.